Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast. My name is Catherine Bennett. I'm the head of marketing and communications for the EBOS Group's institutional healthcare businesses, which include HPS and HPS pharmacies. I welcome you all today to HPS Pharmacy's second webcast lecture. It's very exciting to present this format to you. Uh, this educational presentation can also contribute to your CPD hours to meet the standard set for professional registration purposes. We are recording today's presentation as we do with all of these webcasts so that you can uh, play these on demand afterwards. Notes will also be available by emailing us following the event. And you'll be prompted to do this within 24 hours. After the webcast concludes today, a quick feedback survey will also follow the event. We'd really appreciate you answering just a couple of questions so that we can make sure we target these webcasts appropriately and you get great value out of them. Our agenda today allows for a five minute Q&A at the end. As you know, this is only a 30 minute session to keep it tight. Um, if you could type your questions into the Zoom interface, you will find that below. It looks like some bubbles, speech bubbles down below. You can just type those at any point in time. And then at the end, uh, Danielle can respond to your questions either live or by typing an answer. And hopefully we can answer all your questions during this time slot. If not, we can always come back to you and you can email us afterwards. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Danielle Jiang. Danielle is the Deputy Director of Pharmacy at HPS Pharmacies North Sydney, where she has worked for the past 10 years. Danielle enjoys antimicrobial stewardship activities and has a keen interest in providing training and education to staff members. Today, Danielle will be discussing the role of surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. We hope that you enjoy this presentation and find it very useful to your practice. I will now hand over to Danielle and thank you again for joining us. Great, thank you for your warm welcome, Catherine, um, and welcome to all participants. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking about this topic today. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so surgical antibiotic prophylaxis plays a really important role during the perioperative period to prevent postoperative infections. With appropriate use of surgical antibiotic prophylaxis, the rate of surgical site infections as well as postoperative um, infections have reduced quite significantly. Um, surgical site infections are one of the most preventable of all healthcare associated infections. Um, some consequences of surgical site infection include increased mortality, so patients are twice as likely to die. Um, there's a 60% increased risk of require, requiring admission to the intensive care unit um, and prolonged hospital stay. So it's estimated that patient stays are increased by seven to 10 days um, due to surgical site infections. Patients are also five times more likely to be readmitted to hospital after discharge. Um, so we know that there are significant effects on morbidity and mortality, as well as the financial implications. Um, but we must not also forget the effect that these consequences um, would have on a patient's mental health as well. So when we, when we talk about the use of antibiotics, um, we, particularly as pharmacists, usually have in the back of our minds the issue of antibiotic resistance. Um, antibiotic resistance can occur naturally. However, the use of antibiotics can accelerate the, that process as they exert selective pressure on bacterial populations. So during antibiotic therapy, susceptible bacteria are killed or their growth is inhibited. Um, while bacteria that are resistant to that particular antibiotic survive. And then those traits that contributed to resistance can then be passed on as the surviving bacteria multiply and the result is the spread of antibiotic resistance. Surgical antibiotic, antibiotic prophylaxis is estimated to account for up to 50% of antibiotic use in the hospital setting. 
So it really is important that the therapy used is appropriate. Um, and as we know, the antibiotic therapeutic guidelines is a great resource for deciding on um, appropriate surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, but in some settings, local guidelines are used to guide the decision-making process. Um, and that's based on local and regional differences in resistance patterns. Um, and these local guidelines should be approved by um, your medication safety committee or the equivalent of that. So knowing all this about antibiotic um, resistance and the issues that come from it, how do we know when prophylaxis is important, is a, uh, sorry, is appropriate and indicated? Um, so firstly, it's important that we understand that surgical antibiotic prophylaxis is not always indicated. Um, there are two situations where surgical antibiotic prophylaxis is indicated. One, when there is a significant risk of post-operative infection, and two, in situations where a post-operative infection um, would have serious consequences, even if the, the rate of that particular infection is quite low. The risk of infection is increased for patients undergoing urological procedures due to the presence of bacteria in urine. Um, because of this, preoperative screening is recommended for many procedures that enter the urinary tract. If bacteria in the urine is confirmed, it should be treated with a short course of antibiotics that would be used for the treatment of cystitis. Um, alternatively, a single preoperative dose of gentamicin can also be administered. If patients receive preoperative treatment for bacteriuria, um, surgical antibiotic prophylaxis may or may not be required. Um, it would depend on whether or not the preoperative antibiotic had sufficient activity against the pathogens most likely to cause postoperative infection. So the aim of antibiotic prophylaxis is to ensure adequate serum and tissue concentrations at the surgical site at the time of incision, as well as for the duration of the procedure until the wound is closed. Uh, the timing of administration will depend on the half-life of the drug, the time needed to complete the procedure, and also a range of patient-specific factors, um, such as the patient's body mass index, uh, the patient's renal function, um, and the patient's hepatic function. Surgical antibiotic prophylaxis must always be administered before incision. So if an antibiotic has a short life, for example, kefazolin, the dose should be administered within the first 60 minutes before incision. Um, but for longer agents, the dose may be given uh, within 120 minutes before incision. If the chosen antibiotic requires a slow infusion, so things like vancomycin, um, surgical incision can occur before the infusion um, is complete. So which antibiotics should be used? Um, the most appropriate antibiotic would be one that is effective against the organisms most likely to cause infection following a particular procedure. Um, consideration should also be given to patient factors such as the presence of infection and whether the patient is colonized um, with multi-drug resistant bacteria, as well as local resistance patterns. So broad spectrum antibiotics such as keftriaxone and kefataxine should be avoided. Um, and as such, kefazolin is the most commonly used agent for surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. It's a moderate spectrum cephalosporin um, that's active against staphylococci and streptococci, um, some gram-positive anaerobes, E. coli, Klebsiella species, just to name a few. Um, and the usual adult dose is two grams intravenously. Um, Kefazolin has been found to have low risk of cross-reactivity, um, but in cases where a patient has a severe penicillin allergy, then vancomycin is often preferred, um, sometimes in combination with gentamicin if gram-negative cover is required. A single preoperative dose is considered sufficient in the majority of cases. Um, however, an intraoperative dose may be required if there is significant delay between the preoperative dose and the initiation of the procedure for whatever reason, um, or if the procedure continues when more than two half-lives of the antibiotic have elapsed since the initial dose. 
or if the patient experiences excessive blood loss during the procedure. Um, so this table shows the suggested intraoperative redosing intervals recommended by the therapeutic guidelines. Um, the redosing interval is calculated from the time of the initial preoperative dose rather than the beginning of the procedure. Um, and just also wanted to highlight gentamicin. You can see that the half-life of gentamicin is quite short, but redosing is not required because of its prolonged post-antibiotic effect. Continued dosing of antibiotics for prophylaxis in the post-operative period is no longer routinely recommended um, as the evidence does not show that this pr provides any overall benefit. There are a small number of procedures where a single dose of antibiotics has not been shown to be as effective as 24 hours of prophylaxis. And in these cases, post-operative doses may be considered by the doctor but in saying that, prophylaxis should not extend beyond um, 24 hours. The evidence also does not support continuation of antibiotic prophylaxis until surgical drains or catheters are removed. Prolonged antibiotic use increases the risk of infection with multi-drug resistant bacteria um, and also C. diff. So C. diff causes the most severe cases of antibiotic associated diarrhea. Um, and is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Antibiotic prophylaxis uh, against infective endocarditis was once routinely used for patients with cardiac factors who were undergoing a variety of procedures. However, these recommendations were not based on high quality evidence. Um, and as such, the indications for endocarditis prophylaxis have significantly reduced in recent years. The therapeutic guidelines now only recommend antibiotic prophylaxis against infective endocarditis in patients who are undergoing a procedure with a high risk of bacteremia associated and who also have a cardiac condition that gives a higher risk of adverse outcomes from endocarditis. Surgical antibiotic prophylaxis should form part of a comprehensive strategy to prevent post-operative infection, so including um, perioperative glycemic control. So hyperglycemia, both long-term and during admission, is associated with poorer clinical outcomes, including an increased risk of post-operative infection. So the target range for blood glucose concentration is usually five to 10 millimoles per liter. Preoperative decolonization of Staph aureus is also important. Um, and the strongest data to support preoperative screening for Staph aureus colonization is for is for arthroplasty and certain cardiothoracic procedures as well, particularly when prosthetic material is to be implanted. So mupirocin um, nasal ointment is recommended for this purpose and applied to each nostril twice a day for five days. Um, an antiseptic body wash such as chlorhexidine can also be used as well. Um, and these are the references used to, um, to create this, um, this talk today. Um, and now we're up to some questions. If anyone's got any questions. Um, so we've got a question. How would you classify a penicillin allergy as severe or non-severe? Um, so essentially, a, a severe penicillin allergy would be a reaction that um, involves a, a swelling type reaction. So um, swelling of the lips, uh, swelling of the throat, difficulty breathing, um, whereas a, a non-severe one, or, or you could say a moderate type penicillin allergy is one that, um, for example, would be a, a rash uh, a patient would experience. Um, so the severe ones are often, you know, your life-threatening type allergies um, and your moderate or non-severe ones are, you know, they're a bit of a, a nuisance, but they, they're not life-threatening as such. Thank you for that question. Um, does anyone else have any questions? So when do you begin Staph aureus decolonization? Um, so I believe it's a few weeks before um, the procedure. Uh, 
Um, got another question. Are you aware of the Surgical National Antimicrobial Prescribing Audit um, now available? Would you recommend hospitals do this? Um, yes, so uh, in, in times gone by, um, we've done the NAPS, which is the National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey. Um, and this year we've, is the first year we've undertaken the Surgical um, National Antimicrobial Prescribing Survey. Um, I do recommend it. Um, we are still in the middle of um, collating all the data. Um, it's a good one to do because you can do it uh, retrospectively. So um, it can be a task. Well, in our department, it's a task for our intern to complete. Um, and then we'll put that into um, into the national data and it'll be it'll be quite interesting because we're a big surgical hospital at North Sydney. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the results are. Um, and yes, definitely recommend hospitals do this because it's a, it's a really good um, qualitative way to um, feed back to the relevant departments um, as to how they're doing in, real, in, in terms of, um, you know, whether their choice of antibiotic is appropriate um, and whether their duration is appropriate as well for that, you know, whatever antibiotic they're using. Thanks for that question. Please feel free to type your questions in or if you would like to ask a question live or discuss a particular point, if you can just um, type a note into the chat and I'm, allow, I'm able to um, enable you to talk if you would like to talk with Danielle, if that's a simpler way to approach your question. further looks like we don't have any further questions Danielle um, so thank you very much for giving us your time uh, here we go Michael yes let me just allow you to talk here we go there you go Hi, Michael. Michael okay am I there yes hello okay hello I just wanted to um, one of the, the people asked about the timeline for stuff to colonization um, basically, what you need is you need to ensure that decolonization has been completed at the time the procedure is going to commence. And decolonization should happen for a minimum of five days. So when we talk about starting the process a couple of weeks beforehand, that's correct. But the process starts with collecting a swab, finding out if the patient is colonized with stuff or is and then organising for them to do the decolonisation for five days prior to the procedure. Now, the other point that's important is that if you can't start it, so say so you've got an emergency cardiac procedure coming and the patient's already, already there, then you can start it immediately as soon as you possibly can before the procedure and continue it for up to five days. That's also going to be beneficial to the patient. So oh. I just wanted to, to flag that. Yep. Oh great, thanks, thanks, Michael. Yes, I should have been um, I should have been clearer um, about the the end point. That's great, Michael. Thank you very much for the further clarification. Are there any further questions from anyone? Please feel free to type them in the Q and A, or as Michael did, just drop a chat in and you can speak directly with Danielle and ask for any clarification around any of the slides that have been presented. All 
All right. Looks like you were very clear. So thank you very much, Danielle, for your time. And thank you to those of you who have attended and asked a few questions. Um, it takes a bit of time for Danielle to prepare this material, so we really appreciate her time. We hope you can join us again. Our next event is on Tuesday, the 24th of November. There should be some posters up around your sites. Um, it's on, on the topic of euglycemic ketosis. Is that right, Danielle? I don't quite know how to say that properly. <laughs> Ketoacidosis? There we go. There we go. So thank you, everybody, for attending. We will now close the, um, the call, but it is available for on demand if you did happen to dial in just a little bit late and miss the beginning of the presentation. So thank you again. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.